Hello and welcome. This is Dr. Alexandra Kopelovich, and the topic for today's webinar is kinetics. We will take a look at introduction to biomechanics, Newton's laws, musculoskeletal levers, and pulley systems. So let's get started with introduction to biomechanics. Biomechanics is a study of forces that are applied to the outside and inside of the human body, as well as body's reaction to those forces. Let's examine the difference between kinematics and kinetics. Kinematics is a branch of mechanics that describes the motion of a segment without regard to the forces or torques that may produce the movement. As opposed to kinetics, it's a branch of mechanics that describes the effect of forces and torques on the body. So kinematics answers the questions of what and how, while kinetics answers the question of why. Kinematics permits us to visualize motion, but does not give us an understanding of why the motion is actually occurring, while kinetics does. There are two divisions to kinematics, osteokinematics and orthokinematics. Osteokinematics has to do with the movement of the bones, and orthokinematics has to do with the movement of the joint, the articular surfaces. There are two divisions to kinetics, statics and dynamics. Statics is the study of forces acting on the body at rest or in equilibrium, and dynamics is the study of forces acting on moving bodies. So one more time, kinetics is the study of forces producing motion and or maintaining equilibrium. So why does movement occur? Anytime two objects make contact, they will either exert a push or a pull on each other with some magnitude of force. Whether the body or a body segment is in motion or at rest depends on the forces exerted on that body. So a force is a push or a pull exerted by one object or substance on another. Anytime two objects make contact, they will either push or pull on one another. Let's take a look at some postural definitions. Base of support is something you will be hearing pretty often in this course and your other courses. Base of support is an area bounded posteriorly by the tips of the heels. So this is an example for, for a human body. Um, the tips of the heels of the feet and anteriorly by a line joining the tips of the toes. So this is pretty much the base of support of the human body. As you can see, if we compare image two with image one, we can see that the base of support of a human is much smaller than the base of support of a quadruped. We will soon learn that the size of the base of support creates stability. The larger the base of support, the more stability there is within the body. The center of gravity is a point where mass of the body is centered. It's also known as a center of mass. S2 is typically a center of mass in adults. The center of mass is not fixed. It changes with different positions. When we bend forward, the center of mass changes. When we squat down, the center of mass changes. Sitting, standing, and kneeling all change um, the center of mass. So one more time, center of gravity. The force of gravity on an object or a segment is considered to have its point of application at the center of mass or otherwise known as the center of gravity. Even when the center of mass lies outside of the object, it is still the point from which the force of gravity appears to act. So in a symmetrical object, it is in the center as demonstrated by the sphere right here. In a symmetrical object, it is at the point at which the mass is equally distributed. Towards, typically it's towards the heavier side. So as you can see, a center of gravity or a center of mass would typically be a point where the uh, mass is equally distributed. So you'll be able, the example here is that the person is able to balance all these three objects with, the fin with one finger holding it at the approximately, um, approximately at the center of mass of the object. 
So um, here, the center of mass, as we can see, is not right in the middle. It shifted towards the heavier end of the bed. So this is where the both sides will be, the mass of the bat will be equally distributed. Another example here is a crutch. Once again, the person is holding it closer towards the heavier side of the um, crutch, which means that's where it's going to be balanced. Let's take a look at center of gravity one more time. So as I mentioned before, the body's center of gravity is anterior to the S2 segment. Force of gravity is always vertically downward towards the center of Earth, as demonstrated in this image right here. Each segment of the body also has center of gravity, meaning that, for, uh, in this case, in this example, calves will also have their center of gravity closer to the proximal end, closer to here. A thigh will also have its own center of gravity. Um, the head, arm, and trunk as one unit will have the center of gravity. Each segment of the body will have its own center of mass or center of gravity. If the trunk is inclined forward, as demonstrated in this image right here, the segmental masses remain unchanged. So we can see the mass of the head, arm, and trunk is uh, one segmental mass, and the center of mass of the head, arm, and trunk is located at this point, and the center of mass of the legs is located at this point. Of course, um, the mass will be unchanged, but what will change is the center of mass in relationship to the body when one bends forward. As I've mentioned previously, typically when the person stands in anatomical position, the center of mass is located just anterior to the S2 segment. Once the person bends forward, the center of mass displaces and it changes in relationship to the other segments of the body. So in this image, we can see how the center of mass changes to slightly outside of the body as opposed to being right here anterior to the S2 segment. In order for body to be balanced, we know that the center of mass has to fall within the base of support. So her base of support is right here in between the two feet. So it falls right in between the two feet, meaning that this person will be balanced. Once again, another image right here of a person bending forward. So same principle here. Let's take a look at this football player right now. So as we said, for in order for a person to be balanced, the line of gravity has to fall within the base of support. This person's base of support is this foot. There is um, no other place, uh, only his toes are supporting his entire body. So this is his base of support is very small at this point. When the two feet were on the ground, this was a larger base of support. But now, since the right foot is off the ground, only the left foot creates the base of support. So now we take a look at the segments A, B, and C. Um, letters A, B, and C represent the center of mass of individual segments. A represents the center of mass of the left leg, B represents the center of mass of the right leg, and C represents the center of mass of the hat, head, arm, and trunk. When we combine um, these three center of masses, what we find is that the center of mass has shifted from S2 segment, from just anterior to S2 in anatomical position, to outside of the football player's body. So this is the new center of mass, A, B, and C. If we were to draw a vector line down to see if the center of mass falls within the base of support, we will find that this football, center, football player's center of mass falls very far from the base of support, meaning he's not going to be stable and he will definitely fall down. Let's take a look at some other examples of center of mass changing within the body. Whenever we add an external load, what happens is that the center of mass shifts towards the side of the, towards the heavier side. So as we can see, the center of mass has shifted 
towards the box, up and to the right of this patient. So another thing, what you will notice, that this subject, uh, what he's doing, he's not standing up straight. He's leaning slightly to the left. So why is he leaning to the left? If he were to stand straight, the center of mass, if we were to extend the vector from the center of mass down towards his base of support, we would probably find that it pulls just slightly outside of his right foot. Therefore, he would be unbalanced. In order for this person to be balanced, once again, the same rule applies. The line of gravity has to fall within the base of support. This person shifts his head, arm, and trunk, and of course the external lobe, his box, to the left, which allows now the center of gravity to be aligned within his base of support. And once again, he is able to maintain a balanced position. Let's take a look at the second example here. A person um, walking in a cast. First things that we notice is that the center of mass has shifted from just anterior to S2 to just inferior to the um, prior location of the center of mass. Why did this happen? This happens because a person is wearing a cast. A cast is once again considered an addition of the external load. And because there is an addition of external load, the center of mass will shift towards the heavier side, which in this case is the right lower extremity. Another thing, if this person were not to wear crutches, his base of support would only be his left foot. Therefore, his new center of mass would fall outside of his base of support. Therefore, he would be unbalanced. What this person does by addition of crutches, this establishes a new base of support, a larger triangular, as you can see, base of support. And this allows the center of gravity to comfortably fall within the base of support. Therefore, this person is now balanced. The stability of an object or the human body. Um, here's some principle what it actually depends on. The larger the base of support of an object, the greater the stability, such as an example we saw um, a second ago with a person in, with crutches. The closer the object's center of mass to the base of support, the more stable the object is. We'll take a look at um, the next example. And an object cannot be stable unless its line of gravity is located within its base of support. So lastly, let's take a look at a punching bag example, which is always stable. Two things we apply here. First of all, the punching bag's um, base of support is pretty large. You can see the base of support is um, from here, from the left side to the right side right here. And also the center of mass lies very low. What that allows um, is a very stable um, base of support and a very uh, a lot of it gives a lot of stability to this punching bag. So anytime you punch this bag, it will never fall down. It will always remain stable because its base of support is located low, and because its base of uh, because its center of mass is located low, and because the base of support is pretty wide. Okay, now let's start examining Newton's laws. Newton's first law, the law of inertia, identifies the conditions under which an object will be in equilibrium. If the forces are not balanced, the segment will accelerate. Inertia is the property of an object that resists both the initiation of motion and a change in motion and is directly proportional to its mass. So Newton's first law, law of inertia, Objects at rest tend to stay at rest, and objects in motion tend to stay in motion. At a constant linear velocity, unless acted upon by an external force. Equilibrium equals to constant velocity, and for an object to be in equilibrium, the sum of all forces to that object must be equal to zero. 
Once again, we can look at inertia as an amount of energy required to alter the velocity of the body. It's directly proportional to the object's mass. So for example, more energy is required to speed up or slow down a moving 7 kilo dumbbell as opposed to a 5 kilo dumbbell. Mass moment of inertia. Inertia is a linear counterpart of the mass moment of inertia. Mass moment of inertia is resistance to a change in angular velocity as opposed to linear velocity. Mass moment of inertia depends on the mass and the distribution of mass with respect to the axis of rotation. Most human motion is angular, not linear. Therefore, the concept of mass moment of inertia is directly applicable to the human motion. So let's take a look at this example. Athletes often attempt to control the mass moment of inertia by altering the position of their individual body segments relative to the axis of rotation. The diver in this image reduces the mass moment of inertia by assuming a tuck position in the first image here. He brings his limbs towards the center of mass, closer to the axis of rotation. Based on the principle of conservation of angular momentum, reducing the body's mass moment of inertia results in an increased angular velocity. Therefore, he's able to spin faster. In the image C, you observe the athlete slow the angular velocity by assuming a pike position and increase the body's moment of inertia. So once again, here all the extremities are brought closer to the axis of rotation, um, noted here by the red dot, and here he is slowing down the angular velocity by extending his upper and lower extremities away from the axis of rotation. Now let's take a look at the Newton's second law. The magnitude of acceleration of a moving object is defined by Newton's second law, the law of acceleration. Newton's second law states that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the net unbalanced forces acting on it and is inversely proportional to the mass of that object. So as we can see, the equation derived from the Newton's second law is the sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration. A force, as we defined it earlier, is a push or pull exerted by one object or substance on another object or substance. It's measured in newtons or pounds, and the formula for force is mass times acceleration, as we saw in the previous slide. So one newton is the force required to move one kilo of mass at an acceleration of one meters per second squared. There are different types of forces that we will be examining in this course. Internal and external. Internal forces typically arise from the body's own structures, such as muscles, ligaments, bones, and friction. External forces are um, can, uh, forces externally applied to the body. So such as externally applied resistance, manual resistance, free weights, a door, etc. Two main forces that we will be examining in this course is gravity and friction. A force is a vector. Vector is a quantity that conveys location, direction, and magnitude. They always have a point of application, an action line, and a magnitude. Rotary angular counterpart to Newton's second law states that a torque will cause angular acceleration of a body around an axis of rotation. So torque equals to the mass moment of inertia, which you remember is a rotary, rotary counterpart of inertia, times angular acceleration. So torque is something we'll, we, will, we will be calculating in this course. Torque uh, because most movements of the human body actually happen as rotary movements, not linear movements. Another equation for torque is force times distance. Uh, force equals um, is applied force and distance is the shortest distance between the action line of the application of that force and axis of rotation. Moment arm is something we will be examining during musculoskeletal levers, but we'll start with the definition for now. 
Moment arm, always the shortest distance between the action line and the joint axis. So we'll take a look um, at closer at the moment arm while we will examine musculoskeletal levers. Let's look at an example of torque created in the human body. Contracting bicep produces internal flexion torque at the elbow joint. As we can see, the green line uh, shows us the contraction of bicep, which will create elbow flexion. Therapist hands, right here in blue, produces external extension torque on the body, pushing the patient's hand down and extending the hand forearm segment. In the equilibrium scenario, bicepital torque will equal therapist torque, meaning that nothing, the sum of all forces will be equal to zero. So the patient will exert um, an X amount of force and the therapist will exert an X amount of force and the sum of all forces will be equal to zero. Biceps will achieve a greater angular acceleration, meaning biceps will be able to be the therapist's hand with a smaller mass moment of inertia created by the therapist's hand. So how can we decrease the mass moment of inertia of the therapist's hand? Smaller mass moment of inertia can be achieved by moving the therapist's hand from the hand to the patient's form. Therefore, when the therapist applies force to the form, pushing the form into extension, the elbow, patient's elbow into extension, it's going to be easier for the patient to actually flex at the elbow joint, as opposed to if the therapist's hand will be here. So one uh, thing we're decreasing is we're decreasing a mass moment of inertia. Another way you can look at it is by decreasing the distance of the external force application, external torque application. So by moving from patient's hand to the patient's form, we're decreasing the distance from the axis of rotation to the application of our external force. Now let's take a look at the Newton's third law. Law number three is law of action and reaction. When one object applies a force to a second object, the second object simultaneously applies a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the first object. So let's see the application of that in physical therapy. Here, although a scale is commonly thought to measure the weight of a person standing on the scale, it actually measures the contact of a person to scale. So let's take a look here. Um, GP stands for uh, gravity acting on the person. So we know this is the center of mass of gravitational force pulling the person down. Now uh, we have one force of gravity pulling the patient down. Another force that will be exerted is the patient, patient's uh, weight on top of the scale, which is here, patient scale with the green arrow right here. While the person exerts its own force on the scale, the scale will exert equal but opposite force on the person. So if a person pushes down with 130 pounds, the scale will push back on the person in the opposite direction, 130 pounds of force back onto that person. Now let's take a look at musculoskeletal levers. Internal and external forces produce torques throughout a system of body levers. Lever is a simple machine consisting of a rigid rod, right here in orange, suspended across a pivot point, or otherwise known as a fulcrum. There are three classes of lever, first class, second class, and third class. Let's examine what an entire lever consists of. As I mentioned, it's a rigid lever right here. It has a fulcrum. We have two forces applied, the effort force applied right here and the resistance force applies right, applied right here. An effort force is applied um, an X amount of distance from the axis of rotation, and that is known as an effort arm. 
a resistance force is also applied an x amount of distance from the axis of rotation and it's known as a resistance arm moment arm is a perpendicular distance between the axis of rotation and the line of force application so moment arm can be an effort arm or a resistance arm torque is a force multiplied by its moment arm it tends to rotate a body segment around the axis of rotation so we have an x amount of force acting at this point of um, the lever so to point torque we will take an x amount of force times the distance times the resistance arm and we will be able to find the torque of the resistance force an effort force is the force acting in the direction that the lever is rotating effort force will always be the winner resistance force creates an opposing torque to the effort force and will always be the loser it's important to remember these definitions effort force will always be the winner and resistance force will always be the loser mechanical advantage is a measure of mechanical efficiency of the lever we'll take a closer look at mechanical advantage once we finish all the lever systems let's start with the first class lever system in the first class lever system we find the axis of rotation is positioned in between the two forces applied to the lever right here we have a um, effort force acting and right here we have a resistance force acting so i created the formula for you typically a first class lever system can be balanced um, so we have let's take a look at the anatomical example right away so we have a center of mass of the head constantly pulling the head down our axis of rotation are at the c1 c2 joint right here and in order to balance this force of gravity, in order to make sure that the gravity doesn't always pull our head down, we need to have something active. So our suboccipital muscles are typically always active in order to keep our head neutral. And this creates a first class lever system. We have an effort force, which is our suboccipital muscles. We have our resistance force, which is the gravitational torque acting. So if the gravity pulls us down with 50 newtons of force and it's located 0.01 meters away from the axis of rotation from c1 c2 in order to keep our head in neutral we have 50 newtons of force created by the suboccipital muscles also located 0.01 meters away from the axis of rotation of the joint so head is in equilibrium when the product of force multiplied by the internal moment arm, which is the distance from the point of application of um, the muscle force to the axis of rotation of the joint, equals the product of the head weight, shown right here, multiplied by the external moment arm, which is, once again, this distance right here, which in this equation is 0 0.01 meters once again. Let's take a look at the second class lever system. So now you will notice a difference. Um, the first difference here, and there are two features. The axis of rotation is at the end of the bone. So here, let's uh, start with non-anatomical example for now. The axis of rotation is located at the end of the lever. Muscle or internal force possesses greater leverage than the external force. This is the second feature of the second class lever system. It's very rare in musculoskeletal system. Some examples are calf producing torque needing to stand up on tippy toes. So let's examine this anatomical example now. So we have the axis of rota rotation at the metatarsophalangeal joint right here. Now we have two forces acting on this um, segment. We have a gravitational force known as resistance force right here. And we also have a force of the calf muscle of uh, the gastric nemius and soleus pulling the calf into a heel raise acting at the calcaneus. 
Now, what you will notice is that the resistance force is sitting way closer to the axis of rotation than the effort force. You can see that the effort force is way further from the axis of rotation than the resistance force. What it does, it gives us a mechanical advantage in this system, meaning that if our forces were equal, the gravitational force and the muscular force, muscle will always win because it sits further from the axis of rotation than the gravitational force, than our resistance force. So let's take a look at these numbers. We have our resistance force right here, 533 newtons. Okay, 533 newtons is about 120 pounds of um, body weight pulling down, right, as a gravitational times 0 0.02 meters. So this distance right here from the axis of rotation to our R, to our external resistance, is 0 0.02 meters. Now, in order to keep this equation in equilibrium, we only need 266.5 newtons of gastric nemius um, and Soli's force in order to keep this equation in equilibrium because it sits 0 0.04 meters because it sits further from the axis of rotation than the resistance force. Now, let's take a look at the third class lever system. Once again, there are two features. The axis is at the end of the bone, just like with the second class lever system. And the external weight supported by a third class lever system always has a greater leverage than the muscle force. This is the most common lever used in the musculoskeletal system. So let's take a look. Now we have the axis of rotation and effort force acting the winner that is always the winner and the resistance force that is always the loser. So in order, let's take a look at the bicepital example right here. In order for bicep to create the flexion torque, we're gonna take flexion force of the bicep times its moment arm from the axis of rotation. And we will take a look at the resistance force acting here, which is the dumbbell pulling the elbow into extension. The, the force of the dumbbell pulling the elbow into extension times the um, distance from the axis of rotation to the point of application of this force. So let's take a look at this equation. We have 50 newtons of force times 0 0.06 meters. 50 newtons of force of dumbbell pulling the arm into extension times the distance, how far does it sit from the axis of rotation? So this distance right here from axis of rotation to the point of external resistance is 0 0.6, 0 0.06 meters. In order to keep this equation balanced, we need more force created by biceps. We need 150 newtons of force created by biceps because it sits at 0 0.02 meters from the axis of rotation. So right here, we see that we have, there's more mechanical advantage for the dumbbell to pull our elbow into extension rather than for bicep to flex. So bicep needs to produce more force in the third class lever system as opposed to gastric nemius and soleus producing force in order to lift um, the body on tippy toes in the second class lever system. So here we come to the concept of mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is the ratio of the internal moment arm to the external moment arm. Second class lever system always have a moment arm greater than one meaning that the internal moment arm is always greater than the external moment arm. Third class lever system always has a moment arm less than one, meaning that the internal moment arm is always less than the external moment arm. 
Majority of muscles throughout the musculoskeletal system function with a mechanical advantage less than one, meaning they function in a third class lever system. Some examples would be the bicep, quadriceps, supraspinatus, and deltoid. They all attach to bone relatively close to the joint axis of rotation. The external force that opposes the action of the muscle will typically be exerted further from the axis of rotation. Now let's take a look at this example. This one is a little bit trickier. In the first image, we see quadriceps performing a concentric contraction. Therefore, right here we have the Q is the effort force. QLF is the effort force of the uh, quadricep. In the second image, we see a quadricep performing an eccentric contraction. According to the definition, effort force is always the winner. Therefore, the gravity in this case would be the effort force, while the quadricep is the resistance force opposing the effort force. For example, therefore, this would be a third class lever system. And the second example would be a second class lever system. So once again, we in the first example right here, in the first image, we have quadricep acting as an effort force. It's located close to the axis of rotation. So it's similar to the bicep example that we demonstrated. This is an example of the uh, third class lever system. The second image right here, quadricep is giving in, quadricep is performing eccentric contraction. Therefore, the winning force here is the gravity. This is the effort force. Here, by definition, effort force sits further from the axis of rotation. Therefore, effort force is a winner, and it also sits further away from the axis of rotation. So this would be a second class lever system. So a type of muscular activity, whether it's concentric or eccentric, will also dictate the type of the lever system you're looking at. Now, lastly, let's take a look at pulley systems. Pulleys are used to change the direction of a force for strengthening exercises, mechanical traction, and for functional tasks that involve lifting heavy objects. Depending upon how they're positioned, they can increase or decrease the magnitude of a force. Types of pulleys. We have single fixed pulley that only changes a force's direction, not mechanical advantage. Movable pulley that will change both force's direction and the mechanical advantage. And finally, anatomic pulley. Changes the course of a tendon and improves muscle's mechanical advantage by increasing the length of its moment arm. So let's take a look at anatomical pulleys. They change the direction of a force without changing the magnitude of the force. So that's important. They do change the mechanical advantage, allowing the muscle to produce greater torque around the joint, but they do not change the magnitude of a force. So a common example of an anatomical pulley would be a quadricep muscle over um, a sesamoid bone over patella. Um, what patella does is it deflects the action line further away from the axis of rotation. Therefore, it increases the moment arm of the muscle force. A force of the same magnitude will produce greater torque. So sesamoid bones lie where tendons pass over joints and function to change the direction of the muscles or tendon action line. As a result, increase in the ability of a muscle to produce torque around one or more joint axis. There are several sesamoid bones in the human body, the largest being patella, which we're looking at right here. So let's imagine that there is no patella. The line of pull of quadricep would be parallel to the tibial tubercle. So here we're viewing tibia, femur, femoral condyle. We have 
line the force of quadricep directly up towards the um, anterior inferior iliac spine. Now, this moment arm would be about one centimeter. Therefore, we know that the quadri uh, quadricep torque production would equal to the force produced by the quadricep times the moment arm away from the axis of rotation times this distance. So the greater this distance is, the more torque quadricep will be able to produce. So once again, how do we increase this distance? Well, we just add a sesamoid bone, such as patella. By adding the sesamoid, sesamoid bone right here, patella, we're changing the angle of pull of the quadricep tendon, but we're also elongating the moment arm. By lengthening the moment arm, we're allowing the quadricep to produce uh, less force with the same amount of torque or more torque with the same amount of force. So a quadricep will be able to produce more torque with a longer moment arm.